discussing my favorite watch from my favorite watch brand. What could possibly go wrong? How this video came to be was that I stumbled on older Seamaster Professional listings. Their prices were excellent and they were, you know, half the price of what the current models are going for. And it made me think not just about what you're getting as a watch, but also about their designs and whether or not they were better in some ways than the newer models. Did they understand the brief a lot more and the, the origin of this watch far better? Beyond the excellent build, the classic designs, the Seamaster does come under scrutiny and the modern Seamaster professionals are no different. So I wanted this video to be in part a criticism of some of the elements that the modern Seamaster professional should address into the future. And beyond that, to shed some light on the older references, some notable ones that are worth looking at, and asking that question of whether or not they had a better design ethos understanding. All of that is subjective, of course, and open to our opinions, so let's dive in. I think of all the watch collections out there, the Seamaster is my favorite family. Not the Speedmaster. That in itself is a controversial opinion, I guess. Something we can maybe talk about another time. But what both of these core collections offer is a great selection of diversity across designs and different generations. If you're not keen on the professional liar lug case, there is a more classic CK case choice instead. If you prefer a watch that's smaller or larger than 42 millimeters, there are other options out there. That's why it's a brand that you could fully commit to and collect because it's so open and so spaced out. There's lots of variety on offer. Anyway, I love the Seamaster. My first high-end watch, like many of us here, was the first watch that I ever saw from the distance and I thought, I have to have this one day. It took three years to finally get it and the experience with it has only improved and gotten better day after day. But the old saying goes, no watch is perfect. Debatable. And the current iteration of the Seamaster Professional does have a few issues that we can believe will be remedied with the next generation when it's eventually given to us. It's going to be great because I believe Omega has managed to find their stride with this modern collection. Especially when we look across to the current Speedmaster Professional with the 3861 caliber. After a few small tweaks, I think the modern Seamaster Professional is going to be right up there in the same league. But the continual debate about this new range of professional divers is how they have been beefed up Continually so, it doesn't seem to stop. In size, thickness, dimensions, external features, in this alone there have been plenty of criticisms, even by the most devoted Seamaster owners. But to understand these criticisms before getting into the issues, maybe it's better to think more about how the first generation of Seamaster professionals were presented. If we look at them fundamentally as pieces of design, they adopt a far more organic exterior compared to the harder, more aggressive styling of Rolex professional models, for example. These earlier models with liar lug cases, scalloped edges to the bezel, a crown guard that flowed and extruded from the case. It gives you an impression that this watch was formed by an organic material. It wasn't cut from steel. There is something so elemental in the nature of how these cases work and how they move. And I think the real beauty of the first generation models came from that flow of their design, but also the slimness and the profile of their designs too. Not just the thinness of the case, but how it was complemented by the thinner links of the nine link bracelets. The watch managed to present a dressier quality, but it was still a sports watch. And because of that, it looked far more eye-catching and a lot more interesting when worn. And of course, they started off with quartz movements in the early 90s before moving to automatics a few years later. But even through that transition, they never lost that elegant, slim quality. And it needs to be said how much the slimness of the watch and its bracelet plays into the overall experience of comfort of the watch on the wrist. Something that I think stayed with the Seamaster Professional all the way through to the first ceramic models. With all of that foundation and build up out of the way, the first area of criticism and scrutiny is the current variant being pushed up to 42 millimeters in size. Now this is a light criticism of the watch. It's, it's kind of unfounded. In fairness, Omega has done incredibly well to match the size of all the elements on the watch to meet its slightly larger diameter. The plots, the handset, text placement, bezel size. This is the best overall update to the presentation of this watch ever since its inception. Nothing feels out of place except maybe the larger helium release crown which has also been beefed up. The overall diameter of 42 millimeters makes it a far more applicable choice as a dive watch. If that is what we're using it for, I don't know the percentage of people who buy these watches and actually use them in the water, but I can attest after using a 42 millimeter in the ocean for many, many hours, 
amazing legibility, easy to read at a glance. And to top it off, it can also fit a majority of wrists fairly well. Anyone from a six and a half inch wrist and up would be able to wear this size no problem. Owing to the fact that the lug length is relatively short at 50 millimeters with an adaptable female end link. So the size of the watch is always a point of contention, whether you're using it for daily wear or special occasions, whether you're going to be using it in places like the ocean or on the wrist with a suit. 42 millimeters today is quite the universal size for a dive watch. And compared to the earlier generations at 41 millimeters, this hasn't been much of a change. But then we move to one of Omega's biggest problems, or should I say thickest problems, and that is the overall thickness of their modern watch cases. The current Seamaster Professional measures in the ballpark of 13.6 millimeters, which isn't terrible. But with the addition of an open case back, it could be justified as an unnecessary thickness. Quite, quite a substantial thickness. Especially when you consider that the earlier generations, like the 2531, measured in the ballpark of 11.7 millimeters. And if this thickness comparison makes sense, 13.6 millimeters is closer to 15 millimeters, where 11.7 millimeters is nearer to 10 millimeters. That alone makes a massive difference on the wrist, not only how it presents, but how it feels. Irregardless of the diameter of the watch, if it's overly thick, it's going to dictate how you choose to wear it. And with the thickness of the case, so the individual links of the bracelet have been increased. Even the clasp thickness has been increased. So what all of these details do is push the watch's presence up on your wrist, but it could also give you the impression that it's less refined. Something that is not often spoken about. Of course, the most debatable part of the Seamaster Professional is the non-tapering 20mm bracelet. Gone are the more rounded, polished elements of the 9-link construction in favour of a flatter, matte style, which makes it look a lot more sportier and less like a watch from the past. But it's actually amazing how much of a difference taper makes to a bracelet. Functionally, it lets you have a lot more freedom of movement when you're rotating your wrist. Aesthetically, it looks more considered. Visually, it will make the watch wear slightly smaller in profile. The advantages are all there. Whether Omega will listen or not is another point entirely. Or maybe deciding to go down a more Tudor Black Bay oriented route with defined links that notably get slimmer heading to the clasp, or a more gradual taper that runs between the links and the bracelet. There are plenty of options for them to choose. And taking that all in, this is the real catch-22 of the modern Seamaster Professional. For all the amazing details, massive technical improvements, mechanical improvements, greater presence and balance across the dial with all of the external elements, the watch comes across looking far more brutal and less svelte when looking at the individual parts. Whereas the older models had a more understated, dressy presence that sat nicer in profile, where some of their core features, like the subtle helium escape crown, were not hitting you over the head with their placement on the case, these current models have a far more deliberate look to their design and their elements. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I would argue that the older models had more of a flow between how the case interacted with the bracelets, the crown guards, the bezel, and how it sat on the wrist. This is the really strange thing, right? Because I'm all for modern watches and the great new additions they give us. Mechanical advantages, technical advantages, and all the cool toys that we want. A micro-adjusting clasp with an inbuilt diver's extension, a laser-engraved ceramic dial that looks fantastic, or an enamel-painted ceramic bezel. These are all things we want. But I am starting to look closer at the older generations and thinking, were these not better addressed in places? Did they understand the brief better? Look at the previous ceramic model, arguably with a more dated case and bracelet design linking with that 90s original, but when it's on the wrist, does it not appear less in your face? The fact that this model went out there and used an applied Omega logo on its dial, which is brilliant. Why more brands don't do this, I don't know. It's maybe something that you don't notice at first glance, but it's just such a nice level of difference. It's that detail that matters. More brands should be doing this today, and it's an element that I think should have been included with the latest generation. And even the date window at the three o'clock position with a rounded rectangle frame surrounding it. Dare I say it looks far more deliberate than the frameless cutout at the six o'clock for the current model. And then the overall profile of a reference like the 2531 sitting on the wrist, slim, understated, with a gorgeous wave pattern on its dial. So my argument is why not look back to the first generation ceramic variants for a bargain? What about a model like the last generation of the aluminium bezels from Casino Royale, the reference 2220.80 from 2006? What about looking to those oddballs like the coveted 2254? I, I remember doing a video about this watch a few years ago 
and it seems just now recently more and more people are catching on to it being a fantastic piece. Word of mouth is getting around right now that these are great and people are starting to look at them and it's gaining a lot more interest. I've even been looking at older variants from the 1990s and how they have aged so gracefully, how the tritium on the dial has gone a gorgeous beige color, how the bezels have ghosted. And if all of that is too repetitive and you can't wear a 41 mm piece, why not look to the mid-size 36 mm options? So what should you take away from this video? Would I recommend a Seamaster Professional to you? 100% yes. No matter the generation, the age, these are brilliant pieces and countless testimonials will tell you the same thing. Does the modern watch have a few teething issues needing to be addressed? Yes. Do some of the older variants handle the overall design a bit better, more coherently? Yes. But when we look across to how Omega has tackled the most recent 3861 Speedmaster with that gorgeous tapering braces, how they've played around with the profile of the watch and how you can get a far better fitment on the wrist, I think there is a lot of hope in the direction of how these pieces are going to evolve, especially when we look to the 60th anniversary Bond Seamaster. This is exactly on track with how we want to see this collection change for the better. And like I said at the beginning of the video, I think Omega has found their stride in this department and are slowly working to improve it more. So the real take home from this video is if you can't gel with the current modern Seamaster Professional, there are plenty of other variants out there, all of varying levels of design and some that I think are a lot more interesting and harken back to the 90s better. Is it mad for me to say that instead of chasing the most current Seamaster Professional, I would be looking at the first generation ceramic, probably in black, because I believe there is something a bit more enigmatic and characterful about these pieces. And these designs, while they are certainly of the 1990s and early 2000s, they do hold a special place. The professional models will continue to be a success. And the only question we really need to ask is whether or not Omega will address issues like the overall case thickness of their pieces, the tapering of their bracelets, my biggest hope with this collection is that Omega tries to bring back that svelte appearance that made them so popular through the early years, where they try and lessen the overall brutality of its design in favor of something more organic and elegant. But maybe that's just me. Can you believe it's been half a decade since this generation of Seamaster Professional has arrived? And it's been one of the most successful properties that Omega has produced in a very long time. I think it's fair to say that this current generation has rivaled sales of the Speedmaster Professional and that is impressive. And maybe it's just a bit of nostalgia from my end or my continual seeing of how watches are getting bigger and bulkier and less refined in favor of presence on the wrist. I want to see these older designs, you know, rekindled and reused in places because they had a winning formula back then. You know, with that question foremost in their minds, what made this watch so great? Let us try and capture that again. In the case of the Seamaster Professional, I think it was the slimness, the elegance factor, how the bracelet blended with the case and the bezel. Now I leave it up to you. What are your thoughts? Are the older Seamaster Professionals better? Why do you think so? Or do you think that the current models are the best, the best they ever will be? I'd like to know. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. See you in the next one.